Today talks, it's on base of my, one of my books, it's a root talk, uh, well-known books printed several times, question and answers on the book of Ruth, uh, the publication is Jonathan David. Before we go to the deep understanding of book of Ruth, um, I'll start with a very basic intro introductory question and then we go further. So when it's come to the whole idea of Bible, the whole Tanakh, uh, we have the Pentateuch, we have the Torah, the five books of Moses, the prophets, and the writing, the Ketuvim, <coughs> part of that Ketuvim is Megillot, is the five scrolls, which contain five Megillots, the Shira Shirim, Song of Songs, which we read on Passover, the Book of Ruth, which is the reading, additional supplementary reading on the upcoming festival of Shavuot, the book of Eicha, Lamentation, written by Jeremiah, who read it on Tisha B'Av. Ecclesiastic, or in Hebrew, Kohelet, is the book that we read on the Sukkot, the festival of Sukkot. And the fifth one is the book of Esther, that there is a different variation who wrote. Some said it Esther Mordechai, some said others. But anyway, we read it, as you know, on Purim. Now, why... We read the, uh, why is the book of fruit read on the holiday of Shavuot? So, there are several reasons. Um, first, just as the, the rabbi tells us, the Jews accepted the Torah given to them by Hashem, by God, Mount Sinai. So, the same is Ruth. Soon we're going to delve with her personality. She born as a Moabite, as a non-Jewish uh, uh, woman, accepted the, uh, the uh, yoke, the burden of Torah, and she tremendously demonstrated her uh, desire to convert to, Judu to Judaism in, at any cost, which means at whatever, it's a famous statement, uh, uh, whatever, whatever the cost uh, to her personal well-being. So that's the first reason. The second, um, Ruth is a, is a really good example of kindness. The beginning of the book begins and ends with kindness. The uh, story opened with Elimelech. Uh, before he moved to Moab, was uh, known for his kind deeds. And then the story closed with Boaz, uh, who married to Ruth, and they have the very uh, special son, Oved, whom uh, Naomi cared for. So again, so that's the idea of expressing uh, uh, kindness. Uh, it's like when we discuss the creation of the world and close with a, a Moses uh, burial by God. So in that sense, it's a beginning and end with kindness. The third reason that the Book of Ruth is read on Shavuot is because it's said that King David, the famous psalmist and the warrior that we owe so much, but it's called today the Israel and our own success, our own life, he is, by the, the way it's written, um, he was a great-grandson of uh, Ruth, and David Amelech, King David, born and died at the age of 70, and it was on a festival of Shavuot. So one of the purpose of the book of Ruth was to uh, make Hamelech David legitimate. It was the, it's all, all kind of rumors, and in order to legitimate David, King David and uh, Davinic uh, dynasty, so <coughs> what's more befitting than to have the Megillah truth on the day that King David enters into, uh, into our world and departure from this world. So uh, the book of Ruth, in a way, it's, it is set during the the text said at the end of chapter 1 during the barley harvest so it's a um, also the time that we celebrate Shavuot so for this reason too it's appropriate that the book of food is part of Shavuot uh, festival uh, <coughs> the Baal Shem Tov, the great uh, founder of the Hasidic movement um, um, to, they said that uh, um, taught that each person um, could approach God directly, which means we don't need intermediary. So he always said that, particularly through our prayers and joyous observance of the mitzvot. So this uh, idea of the teaching 
it's uh, reaffirmed the message that are uh, conveyed to the Book of Ruth that the real devotion to Torah and Mitzvot. Now, the author of the Book of Ruth, we follow the tradition way that uh, yeah, that is the Shmuel, the prophet Samuel, mm -hmm. is the author of the Book of Ruth. Um, uh, Shmuel, uh, Samuel was a biblical uh, prophet, uh, some say that the first in the Tanakh in that sense, um, about 3,000 years ago, and he was the one who ushered the new age of prophecy, so the sages refer to Shmuel as a teacher, the, the prophet who follows, so in that sense he was son of Hana, uh, who cried a lot, the story of Eli and beginning of Samuel, and then she inherited um, her son Samuel, but Samuel who was the one who um, the, appointed David as the king after the whole very painful story with King Saul. And the reason that Samuel wrote the book of Ruth is because Ruth was a Moabite uh, 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 convert to Judaism. And she was King David's great-grandmother. So the <coughs> Talmud referred to us that it was a big to-do over over the conversion of Ruth. The Torah <coughs> said that uh, in the book of Deuteronomy that um, Moabite and Ammonite should not enter the, the congregation of God mm -hmm. forever. And then the big question is, so how come um, they allow it? The Talmud said that it wasn't learned properly at that time, but basically the Torah says specifically the word Moavi, which in Hebrew clearly said male Moabites. It doesn't apply mm -hmm. to female. It was a big tumult, big to do over that, and, uh, and according to our tradition, Samuel wrote the Book of Ruth in order to substantiate David, God giving claim to the throne of Israel, which means the Book of Ruth is the uh, testament to King David's genealogy, as well as his fine character and, uh, and, uh, and Ruth. So. The, the whole problem was the Torah said that they did not greet us when we left Egypt with bread and water, the Moabite. Mm -hmm. and the Torah said in a very clear way in Deuteronomy 23, the Torah said, shall not enter the community of the Lord, even to the tenth generation, they shall not prohibit it forever. And the Torah even gave an example. They said this is because they did not meet the Israelite with bread and water, and did not come out of Egypt because they hired Bilam. To curse you, etc. So, so the Torah said that. Therefore, we have no no business with them. But the the rabbis derived from that that apply only to male, and it was unknown. So, in other words, you may ask if marriages between Jews and Moabites are forbidden by the Torah, why would Boaz have permitted to marry Ruth uh, when Ruth and Naomi returned uh, from Moab, and the the prohibition apply only to Jewish women who wishes to marry Moabite men? which means Moabite women were permitted to convert to Judaism and marry Israelite men, in that sense. Um, anyway, um, we'll go straight to the, um, the um, book itself, but again, um, um, I just want to give a very short vignette, abbreviation of the story. The story of the Book of Ruth uh, uh, opens with Elimelech. Elimelech was the husband of Naomi and father of Mahlon and Kilion. You have the chart in the book. It takes me hundreds and hundreds of hours to prepare that chart. In the chart you see a very clear a uh, list of uh, genealogy which is where, who came from, who is the first, who is the second and how it works since uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob go to Haran and Lot and ends up by the children of uh, Jacob and the great-great-grandchildren of Lot which ends up the uh, Boaz um, um, and um, Ruth. So basically um, the husband of Naomi and the father of Machlon and Kilion excuse me, was Elimelech. And Elimelech was a very important person. He was the head of the tribe of Yehuda, Judah. He is a man of the great status and wealth. And he was a pillar of kindness. He always ready to help others, the Mepharshim said. However, with his all wealth and everything, when it was a heavy famine, uh, stuck the whole land of Canaan, 
he felt that he cannot survive this calamity with this continuing of act of kindness. So he basically closed his heart to his fellow uh, Israelite and he just fled. And he didn't just fled out, he just fled to the enemy territory, which is Moab. So there is a lot of a... Uh, um, uh, he lost his fortune when he did it, whatever left over he lost, and then he lost his life after being there 10 years. His wife, Naomi, um, he was, she was the mother of Mahlon and Kilion, and she was mother-in-law of Ruth and Orpah, which means Naomi left the land of Israel in a sense as a wealthy or very wealthy and respected woman and she returned as the destitute widow. So again, it shows you the ups and down life and the, the character, the human story, the human behavior. Machron and Kilion, so the rabbi said that that's not the real names. Talmud said that they have a yeah, Yoash and Saraf, that's the real names. They use a nickname to illustrate their behavior because Machlon and Kilion were the sons of Elimelech Naomi. They accompanied the, their um, parents to Moab. But when the father died, instead of coming back, they marry out of faith to Moabite woman. Uh, Machlon married Ruth, Chilion married Orpah. And after 10 years of moving to Moab, uh, the brothers die, um, not just die, but die penniless without children. So it was a, upon Naomi, it was a crisis upon crisis upon crisis upon crisis. Leaving the family and friends, going to a foreign land, going to enemy's land, losing the wealth, losing the husband, having the children married to Moabites, losing the children, and losing everything. So she is in a point that it's such a level that nothing left. Ruth, one of her daughter-in-law, um, she is not just the uh, hero, the, um, how do you say it, Her heroine? Heroine, Her yeah. heroine of the of the story. Um, uh, according to many sources, one of them is the Midrash, who said that she was a royal descendant. I mentioned that in the chart because she was the daughter of the King Eglon of Moab. It's a very well-known uh, king in the Tanakh. She married to Machlon, son of Elimelech Naomi, and then she co converted to Judaism when, when her husband died. So it's a variation when exactly she converted. There are an opinion that she converted while she married or even before. There are opinion that she converted only upon return to the land. Uh, by Naomi, there is an opinion that she convert much later by Boaz and his uh, rabbinical court, his Bet Din. So, but in a pshat, in a simple way, upon her husband's death, she um, accompanied her mother-in-law from Moab to Bethlehem, uh, uttering the very famous word, whenever you go, I'll go, whatever you lodge, I'll lodge, you people should be my people, and you God, my God. So that was the point that, in a way, she accepted the uh, yoke, the burden of Judaism upon himself, and that's the, the most uh, yeah, well-known traditional attitude that that was the point of, of conversion. Uh, Orpa, in a way like, Ru like Ruth, Orpa also the daughter of the king of Moab. Some say that they are sisters, but Orpa <coughs> married Machlon's brother, which his name is Kilion. But when he died, um, she was persuaded by Naomi to return to her family, and, uh, and she did it. She turned, all pies like, turn you back. Some hold that her grandson was Goliath, son or grandson. She was raped in the way, and that's her son. It's all Midrashim. Now, another important character in his book, it's Boaz. Boaz was a Elimelech's nephew. If you, again, if you look at the chart, you see the chart. Uh, and he called a man of, a man of substance because the, <coughs> he was a hero of the story. Uh, Boaz, uh, he redeems Elimelech property and he took a chance and married Ruth. And then the son, Boaz and Ruth's son, whose name is Oved, mm -hmm. was the King uh, David grandfather. So that's, and the last one, uh, before we go straight to the text, is a Ploni Almoni. Ploni Almoni, it's a he Hebrew. Uh, equivalent like he's saying uh, so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, okay. which according to the Midrash, Elimelech's brother. But again, they 
treat them nicely, those characters. They don't want to mention certain bad behavior. So some said his name is Tov, some said it others. But anyway, Plony Almon is like saying Mr. So-and-so, which apply that he, that he, in a way, he used the right to, to, of first refusal, which means it was a right over, over Boaz, because he was the closest relative, and he had a chance to redeem Elimelech's property, but in a condition of marrying Ruth. So at the beginning he said, fine, to redeem the property, why not? But then when he realized that it involved the um, marriage of Ruth, he backed off. Either because he was already married and concerned about uh, imperiling his uh, children's inheritance, or other reasons, but anyway, he refused it, and then... Um, um, he basically lost that opportunity. Now, according to the sages, Ruth lived to very, very old age, and she had this hood, she was married to see the building of the first Beit HaMikdash, the first temple, and even her great-great-grandson, uh, King Solomon. So it's a midrash, and they said that um, um, some hold, some ask where is the Ruth buried? So according to some archaeological uh, evidence, um, is um, inconclusive. Uh, some contemporary religious experts believe that Ruth is buried at a, uh, it's called a place in Israel, Admot Yishai, near the city of uh, Hebron, which is one of the world uh, oldest cities and the famous site of the cave of Machpelah, you know, the cave of the ancestors, the patriarch, you know, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca and uh, Jacob and Leah buried. <coughs> it's very fitting to say that Hebron, Hebron was King David's original royal city. Today some people make pilgrims to what they believe it's the Ruth grave, but again. In chapter 1, So they said that over about 3,000 years ago, it was a man by the name of Elimelech, highly esteemed citizen, of Bethlehem in Israel, order of a livestock and abundance of a, a farmland. When the family, uh, when the famine swept the country, Elimelech and his wife Naomi and the two sons Machlon and Kilion fled to the land of Moab, despite the hostility of the Moabite people toward the Israelite nation. Elimelech soon died. Machlon and Kilion married Moabite women in defiance of the biblical law prohibiting such a union. And ten years later, uh, both sons perished, leaving their grieving childless wives, Ruth and Opa, and the widower mother destitute. So that's the very beginning of chapter one. The first book, the first word of the book, they said Vaihi, Vaihi meaning something, alas, wow, something said. And they said, a, um, um, the first verse is more specific. He said, um, In the day that the judges were judging. And the rabbis dwell on that and express that the judges were adding that the judges were being judged. Which means, instead of if effectively they really take the leadership and the responsibility of leading the Jewish people, some judges were um, inept, unable to influence men like Elimelech to do the right thing and remain in Israel, or even corrupt, some said, that accepting bribes and payment for favorable rulings, it was a lot of issues. That's the idea of the judge's judge. So they said, it was a cause and result. Because it was a corruption, then Hashem created a famine in that land, in the land, Vayelech ish, ish, it means Elimelech mi Beit Lechem Yehuda lagur biz de Moab he didn't leave, um, you know, in a sense to be permanently his original intent is just for short time until the situation will change for better hu v'ishto u'shtevalam which means they are all in that sense has a weak character they don't really want um, to do it, but they did it because in a way he asked to make it happen. Now, um, if you ask a question, how important is Melech like Elimelech? 
Elimelech wasn't just an act of another fellow that just left, quit, and moved. He was a member of the um, illustrious tribe of Yehuda, the son of Nachshon, the, I mean, the descendant of Nachshon, pursued by the Egyptian army, followed the Exodus, Nachshon, the famous one who jumped to the Red Sea, and, and uh, it was a tremendous example of leadership, even at the most difficult text, at, at the test, and uh, that was the leading tribe, and all of a sudden, Eli Melech, Eli Melech in that sense, Eli mean my God. How many generations from the Exodus was this? If you count the Exodus, and you said it's about <coughs> 3,500 years ago, mm -hmm. and then you take all the descendants in between, you're talking a good number, look, they are in the desert for 40 years, mm -hmm. and then they entered the land at different periods. You, you can assume that it, it was in a neighborhood of about 100 years, in, in a sense, of 40 years in a desert, and then the Joshua leadership and the judges leadership, so it, uh, at about least... About three or four generations. Or at least, yeah. at least that, that. If you look at the book uh, Seder Adorot, he gives you the exact timing, time frame. Anyway, Bethlehem, house of bread, it's name of city, but it's also central, Bethlehem, it's very central. And tribe of Yehuda was the leading tribe. So a role model like Elimelech, a community leader and a judge and a philanthropist, just pick himself up and leave hometown. And it's basically defy logic because um, you can say that logically it makes no sense. But in a mystical way, one can say, can say that he was uh, dispatched by God on a mission to redeem Ruth. Uh, well, that was the consequence. But it's hard to get that direction. It's just some of Malbim, some of the rabbi's opinion. So, but hypothetically speaking, if uh, Elimelech uh, uh, remained in Israel, uh, the thing may be different, right? In other words, if Elimelech stayed in Bethlehem with his wife and sons, rather than the fling to Moab, uh, his very present must have uh, given his fellow uh, Jew strength and courage, but instead Elimelech have, uh, could have prayed to God to stop the famine, to bring rain, and uh, to restore the harvest, but uh, he and his son might not have uh, die a premature death in that sense. But, so, why he choose to go and, and do such a thing, to, to go to, uh, not just the enemy, so most of the rabbis hold that he was a miser, which means he was unwilling to risk his fortune to aid um, to his neighbor during the famine. Mm. Uh, which happens sometimes when, when their wealth gets to the people's head. Uh, my money, my property, it's very hard to get it out of their mind. So I accepted that uh, to Moab, like a, a magnet, right? Elimelech ran away from his people, from his land, from his destiny, to join the nation known as the, their stringency. So it's like one go. The Torah cursed the people of Moab for failing to share the bread and water when the Jewish people fell, uh, follow Egypt. So, so that's, you know, wars to the wars. It's not just living and it's not just living the enemies. It's joined the enemies who are basically well known as a greedy people. So, but the, the other extreme side is Ruth, on the other hand. She rejected the country of her birth and eager, eagerly uh, joined the Jewish nation. So, um, uh, also, if you think how Elimelech's die, uh, the idea of poverty, the Talmud said, is it's worse than death. Elimelech died twice. In that sense, first when he lost all of his money, and then when he lost his life. So, God often d diminishes a person gradually, uh, giving him a, or her a chance to repent. And but through the loss of the fortune. Uh, the hope is that a person will do teshuva and change his way, but Elimelech failed to um, correct his evil ways, to take the signal from God and, and change for better, especially when he lost his wealth. Now, Naomi was Elimelech's wife and the mother. Naomi is basically pleasant, mm. but when she returned, she called herself bitter, mara because all the, all the crises that befall on her one after the other, right? Um, there is a Midrash that said that she was his niece, but anyway, she left 
Some say that she was pregnant because she said, Ani alakhti. Or some said that Ani alakhti, I left full, she meant to say with money. Right? But the big question is she was really willing to go to Moab or she protested Elimelech's decision to leave Bethlehem. So it's hard to define, especially in those days. But the Midrash said that Naomi was good nature and sweet. She just followed her husband to Moab out of the uh, loyalty, wifely loyalty, right? Uh, um, she had uh, some type of a, um, um, feeling of following her husband. Um, but uh, in that sense, if she refused to go, it's a all hypothetical question, what will happen? Right, I mean, if in those days, could a wife have refused to go? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, there is a one story about the wife that saved her husband from sinning by refusing. The, you know, it's a very famous story in Korach about the, the On Ben Pellet from the tribe of Reuben, that his wife was involved for not making him part of the Korach's team, and she saved his life. So, um, you may say that, uh, you can say that she doesn't have the strong character, or you can say that uh, she just follow her husband, or that was her destiny. But um, the sages say that, that Machlon and Kiluyon were 12 and 17 years old. So when they accompanied their parent to Moab, that was their age. Um, and the big uh, point is that that's not their real name. Uh, Machlon, it's the... Uh, it's a um, destruction, and kilayon is the annihilation. So they, some say that Shmuel called them this name because they, he is implied to their behavior. Okay, now, the original name, as we said, the Gemara said that the name is as the written book of Chronicles, Yoash and Saraf, which means that it's a fire. It's fiery, fiery, right? They behave disobeying and everything, they, they turn to be a machlon and kilion, an Okay, now they said that machlon and kilion marry Ruth and Opa, right? Mm -hmm. And they are basically sisters. So, does the Ruth and Opa share the same mother? So, most of the rabbis agree that they did. Some uh, contend that Ruth and Opa were only half sister, mm -hmm. and they share the same th <coughs> father, but they have a different mother. <coughs> okay. Right. So why why they they attract to Machlon Kilion? So the rabbi said that they uh, it was all related to uh, to money and power, daughter of Eglon, and money goes to money. That's many of hold that way. Right, and uh, the king himself was a very bad personality, wicked father, and um, it was all. So how does someone like Ruth come? It's very good. How uh, you, you ask uh, how come? How come the Balatanya ask? He ask in the book of Tanya. He says how a righteous person sometimes come out of very evil person, vice versa. That's a very mind-boggling question. Now, if you look at the name Ruth. Uh, it is said that Ruth's name uh, at birth was Gilit. And uh, the Midrash said that the name Ruth comes from the word uh, Revaya, which means abundance or uh, saturation. So King David, the Ruth grandfather, filled the world with a beautiful psalm praising God, like someone who water dry a field, a, a dry field and make it bloom. So when one adds together the numerical value of each of the letter Ruth name, which is called Gimatria, right? Mm -hmm. It's Reish Vav Taf, mm -hmm. which is 606. Reish is 200, Vav is 6, and Taf is 400, 606. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, we have 613 laws. Mm -hmm. And 7 is for everyone. It's a universal Noahide laws. Right. So Ruth plus 7 Noahide laws is 613. That's a well-known um, point. And the seven Archai laws uh, is the laws that uh, apply to everyone. Right. Jews and non-Jews, the prohibition on adultery, bl blasphemy, murder, sexual immortality, uh, robbery, eating lamb from a living um, creature, require establishment of the court of justice. All of that is the 
part which you call seva noach lo. Orpa, orpa in Hebrew meaning oref, the, the, like the nape of the neck, which uh, um, the, the person that uh, um, reverted their life to adultery. Okay? So, the big question is, did they, Ruth and Opa, convert to Judaism before they marry Machlon Kilion? So, majority of the sages say that they did not convert to Judaism before marrying Naomi's son, which is why Machlon and Kilion were punished by, by death. Some uh, commentators um, contend that the two w- uh, women told their husbands they will convert, but were not sincere. Other scholars uh, um, say that sisters were too young at the time of the marriage to make the binding commitment to convert. But um, most of the rabbis said it happened later with Ruth. Right? Um, I have a question. How the sons, essentially, of a penniless Jew that had run to enemy territory would actually be able to marry the daughters of the king of... Well, there are several interpretations. One said that they lost <coughs> the wealth after they got married. Mm. Others said it was a huge privilege for, the, for them to marry the, the children. In a simple way, the wealth was lost after, after that happened, which means the marriage took place later. But it's, it's a good question. I mean, when exactly they're still enemies, happened? even if they still had the money. I mean, yes, was, yes, yes. So. But most probably they, they, either they have something, or they have it before, or they... It's, mm. it's, the, the key point is, it, it's, it's not a positive motivation for neither one mm-hmm. to make things like that happen. Now you can ask how did Naomi uh, react to her son marrying uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> this type of Moabite women. So, so if you read carefully the text, you see that Naomi is said to, to have been a devoted mother, but some sages, however, uh, f- um, fault her for her um, being so pas- pa- uh, passive, which means um, some sages blame her for not preventing her sons <coughs> from uh, marrying Moabite women. Other sages argue that Naomi was very upset and she just kept silent, but um, it's clear that it was a uh, um, it wasn't pleasant for her, the whole situation. Um, If you go further in the text, they said that in the Pasuk Vav, the verse says that Naomi started out with her daughter-in-law and she returned to Moab, the land of Israel. Mm-hmm. Why she decided to leave everything and to go? She had three graves there. She had the grave of the husband, she had the graves of two sons. Mm-hmm. So why she wants to leave everything and go to the land of Israel? So the rabbi said that Naomi learned that the, the, the famine um, ended in the Holy Land and therefore she wants to survive so she resolved to leave the um, the ill-fated Moab where she had known nothing but grief so um, she planned to leave immediately after observing the seven day mourning period known as uh, Shiva for her sons so she, if, she, if Naomi stayed in Moab she felt sure that she would die in early death too. So in other words, it's a very painful story, but she had the grave of the husband, she had the grave of the two sons in Moab, and uh, on the other hand, she felt that the food is in Beit Lechem, and she rather crossed the border and leave to survive. So uh, how she learned that is, uh, the famine in, in the land of Israel uh, ends and the, the economic picture improves. So one soul said, says that the Jewish peddlers came to Moab selling the produce of the Holy Land. And from these peddlers, Naomi heard that the good news that the famine is over. But anyway, uh, <coughs> uh, Bethlehem was the city of Naomi youth. And in a way she felt called to return. The Torah comments uh, uh, in a very clear ways that Bethlehem is a good name and the uh, um, Bet Lechem, the house of bread. So in a sense, Naomi believed deeply in the goodness of the people of Israel and she was confident that somehow she, the loving nature and their ability to forgive let her come. It was not by all means her fault for all this 
crisis that befall upon her. And now the text said that she argued, and Naomi argued with her daughter-in-law. She said to them, turn back, each of you to her mother's house. Her mother's house. Yeah, it's because uh, they, <coughs> they came from the house of Eglon, the royal family, rich Moab family. But why rather than a father's house? Why would it say mother's house? So one of, of the verses said that they just share the same mother. Some just say that usually girls go back to the mothers in that sense. But but the father was the king. In other words, and she used the word, May Hashem deal kindly with you as he dealt with the dead and with me. So she, she meant to say that the same ways that Eliezer, Abraham, a trusted servant, he went to Haran and he found a bride to Isaac, Abraham's sons. So to God's miraculous intervention, right? Eliezer recognized Rebecca as being the uh, perfect spouse to, to, for Isaac. And Eliezer gave Rebecca the beautiful uh, jewelry uh, that he was taking along um, and he asked her if he could possible um, uh, for him to spend the night with her home and she answered a uh, famous statement uh, from Rebecca. She said that um, um, she ran and told my, her mother's uh, household so all the, that had transpired, you remember that? So this, the, the, it's uh, uh, Rashi, the great 11th century commentator, he said that, that, that those times the women have their own, um, you know, sense, uh, qu uh, quarters. Uh, they they walk and spend their days, uh, and the daughter, being especially close to her mother, will go to her rather than to her father, with uh, important news. So that's why Rebecca went to the mother's house. So the same true the story. Naomi uh, understood the privileged mother-daughter relationship in a sense. Uh, when trying to persuade Ruth and Opa to return that they're ready to have the company with her to Israel, so Naomi mentioned uh, uh, of the mother's house. Uh, she like uh, evokes uh, uh, vivid memories of the uh, cherished place. In a sense, she appreciated Ruth and Opa loyalty to her, uh, but since the husbands uh, were dead, uh, they will not uh, abandon her. So uh, Naomi, uh, she said, uh, I'm only the mother of your deceased husband. Why not return where your heart really belongs to your own mother? Right? And she used the word, May Hashem, may the Lord deal kindly with you as dealt with the dead and me. So it's a fascinating Midrash. The Midrash remarks on the great kindness of Ruth and Opa um, that they showed their mother-in-law in the, um, uh, you know, when the, the whole uh, living Mahlonik in Leon to West, because according to Moabite law, the Midrash said, uh, a man was required to set aside money to cover his uh, burial expenses and to sustain his widow after his death. So in the event that he died penniless, uh, his family was obligated to assume those uh, responsibilities. So when Mahlonik in Leon died, Naomi couldn't even afford the shrouds in which uh, to wrap them. So the Mitra said that Ruth and Opa, which is amazing, um, somehow found the money to give their husbands proper burial. So this is what Naomi refers when she asks uh, God to, re to, to defray or to re uh, repay Ruth and Opa for their kindness to the dead. Naomi and Opa uh, also were uh, entitled to money uh, for the living expenses. So Naomi will have been obligated to pay them, but in their great kindness, Ruth and Opa waived uh, all this uh, claim. And Naomi asked God to reward them for this as well. So that's the idea. Instead of uh, a king to return to their own home, Ruth and Opa replied to Naomi in sentence that it says, No, we'll return with you to your people. Um, and they use the word you, not our people, because Ruth and Opa intended to accompany Naomi to the land of Israel. However, um, they did not plan to convert to Judaism, the rabbi said, uh, which is why they refer to you people and not using the word a uh, our people. And then they said, she said to them, Naomi said to them, why should you go with me? She asked her daughter-in-law, have I more sons in my body that might be husband for you? In other words, you have no futures there. Why, why are you doing that? What did Naomi meant? 
in a sense, Naomi response to her daughter-in-law was a, a in a sense a, a theoretical response. She had no plan to remarry, and probably was past her childbearing years, right? But even if Naomi were to have sons in the future, by whom uh, Ruth and Opa could have sons to carry their uh, deceased husband's names, they too have been well past their childbearing years by the time Naomi baby boys were old enough to marry. So, now the next question, if Naomi was too old to bear more children, why couldn't she help Ruth and Opa to find other Jewish men to marry them in Israel, right? But if Ruth and Opa were unwilling to convert to Judaism, Naomi believed it's in a way impossible for her daughter-in-law to find husbands in Israel. Without converting to Judaism, Naomi knew that no regular Jew, regular Israelite men will marry Ruth and Opa. So Opa decided to return home, and the text said that she kisses her mother-in-law farewell, but Ruth clung to Naomi. So what's the real difference between this time, sign of affection, between kissing and climbing? The rabbis have a lot to say about it. So the rabbi said that Orpa never intended, intended to convert to Judaism. She generally um, um, uh, desired to remain with her mother-in-law, right? But uh, for Orpa could sense the greatness and the holiness of the nation of Israel, but she wasn't ready to embrace Jewish practice. That's not for her. Naomi convinced her that it will be too difficult for her to live as a foreigner in Israel, especially in those days. So Orpa gave her mother-in-law a, in our language, a parting kiss, and left, right? By the way, the text doesn't say that she kissed Ruth goodbye, um, but some rabbis said that perhaps she sensed that they were already a world apart. It's not clear, it's just she kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, on the other hand, clung to her mother-in-law out of enormous love for her, but also for all of Judaism. She was prepared to embrace the Jewish religion. So, in other words, Naomi, one second, Naomi not taking Ruth to Israel with her, Ruth will have made the journey on her own, the rabbi said. So, in the sense, luckily, Naomi recognized the depth of Ruth's feelings. Uh, Orpa kiss expressed love, but Ruth's gesture were more intense and, and, and passionate. Yes, Bruce. Uh, Doctor so, Bruce. the Im implication when Ruth pointed out the difficulty of living in the land of Earth's history. Naomi. Naomi pointed out to, to Ruth and Orpa pointed out the difficult living as a foreigner. Mm -hmm. That was the dividing point between the two, uh, her, between her two, uh, I guess, former daughter-in-law. Theoretically because, and theologically, so, right. So that must, so if Ruth decided to go, it must have meant... At any it, price. It may have meant that she had the seat already, that she's not going to be a foreigner. So you're going to throw a lot in with the Jewish people somewhere along. It's because that that's the only reason I can go in many ways. But that made the difference between Ruth sticking with Naomi and Oprah, Oprah, you know, going back to her people. That might have been <sighs> learning the, the book of Ruth, Doctor Bruce, for many many years of my life. I can summarize. Most of the Mefarshim, most of the commentators, from Al-Sheikh to Malbim, all different commentators, that Ruth loved the concept of Judaism, the theological concept of Judaism so much, so deeply, that she doesn't care for, in a sense, for having husband, children, money, future, or anything. She was just in one thing, to be together, with them uh, in the land of Israel. That was her goal.